So this is um, Davidian Corley. Um, so what do you do for a day job? My day job? I'm a musician. Awesome. That's musician. my thing. I'm so he's going to show us um, some Raspberry Pi and possibly some Arduino. Uh, Arduino, mostly a little bit of talking about Raspberry Pi and which and why and stuff like that. Yeah, and applications and what you might want to do. Yeah. So let me just fire some buttons up here. And select the right device. I think it should still be on, on the right one. Are we coming up? Quick. Oh, you all saw it. Excellent. I'll change that later tonight. <laughs> I'll change that now. Excuse me. <laughs> and find where I was here. The funny thing is on screen display, I'm kind of typing a game password and see letter by letter, right? It's certainly one character at a time. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> Never do that. No. Um, Why don't we open your phone? That's what you'll tell us. I, uh, uh, it's interesting to be here. Um, it's kind of a funny route for me because uh, uh, I used to do computer science in high school when it was basic in the 80s and it, before Commodore 64s. It was actually, uh, we had a machine, uh, two machines, uh, Digital Equipment Corporation Classics. They were the size of desks. They had a monitor we wrote uh, on uh, pencil cards, penciled in all our basic code, fired it in. Um, uh, one had 3K and the big one had 5K around. Right? Mm -hmm. And they were, they were essentially uh, um, uh, digital equipment, small PDP computers, very small, limited. Um, it was a Microsoft Basic or something like that that was using. But, um, so I had some experience with that and uh, uh, a musician and I started working on music computers, musicians' computers, because back in the, the 90s, everyone had uh, Macs with the uh, old pre OS 10 systems, and they broke constantly. So I actually had a lot of work running around fixing computers. And uh, it was really simple. You just pulled out all the extra drivers that they threw into whatever folder it was. I can't remember what at the time. But, um, so uh, I started, when OS 10 came out, I started learning a little bit about the command, plan, command line, installed Fink, discovered all sorts of stuff, cool stuff there, and then actually started working with some virtual machines and Linux and built a Linux client server. And somehow I'm here today and it's kind of weird. <laughs> How did I make this circle? So, but uh, Kevin invited me because I did a presentation on a device I have over here. Um, and it, 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 the, the kind of the subject of this, there's a lot of stuff coming up in the slides and that about specific things, but this is kind of about applications of these devices like Raspberry Pis and Arduinos and some other things. Um, and uh, uh, what happened with me is when the Raspberry Pis came out a few years ago, I thought like, well, obviously that's really cool. You could have a small, really cheap computer if you've got somewhere you don't want to keep your computer, like I have one in my shed outside with a, with a surveillance camera on it. Right, I built a, 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 a Raspberry Pi uh, video camera system. Um, I'm not too worried if my $50 Raspberry Pi freezes in the winter. And it did very well last winter. It kept going, no problems. So it's just in a little box I got at the dollar store. Right, It was actually, I think, 50 cents. And I cut a hole in the top and put a camera out the top. And it works great. Uh, I get video from that. I have uh, four or five Pis running doing video surveillance because we have some weird neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, kind of breaking bad-ish, but they, they're not really there. They just think they are. But um, uh, so, so I, when the question came up, I was like, hey, what are we going to do? Are we going to buy a security system? I looked at price at security systems, and I realized I already had a Pi, and I was already starting to do some of this stuff. And I thought, well, hey, here's an application. Um, I just get like three more, link it up to a couple of cameras in that we already have, some USB cameras, and see what happens. And I used a, a, a program called Motion, uh, just available in the you know, Debian distributions, various distributions, to set this up. It, sends, uh, it sets up a little web server, and from a central Pi, it takes in all these uh, images over uh, the web server, and then redistributes on a separate page. It, it was uh, really neat, having already gotten into using that, to see an application for it, right? Um, but the real question came up at first that I, uh, uh, I've been a musician for a long time. I'm also diabetic and hypothyroid. That's why I've got this scar here. So I don't heal well. 
And one of the things that musicians do is a lot of practice, and uh, I develop very severe tendonitis in both hands, playing the flute, right? So saxophone, flute, things like this. But apparently, if you do four or five hours of practice, you're doing like 15, 20, 25,000 repetitions a time, and you're doing that every day. So I got massive tendonitis. So the question for me was, the Raspberry Pi seemed to have an application, education, perhaps stuff like these cameras and things like that. But what on earth would you do with the Arduino device that everyone was talking about when it does very similar things? And uh, part of what I talked to, uh, mentioned in the, the cover of this is the GPIO, the general purpose IO. Um, on the Raspberry Pi, you'll see there's a, a row of pins on it. Probably everybody knows about this. Does everyone know about GPIO and Raspberry Pi's is a pretty good thing? Yeah, okay. So Raspberry Pi has 40 GPIO pins on it now, right? Um, Arduinos have about uh, uh, 25, 30 pins on. They actually do a little bit more on the Arduinos than the Pi. The, uh, the Raspberry Pi can take uh, uh, a higher low signal, uh, uh, three volt uh, or zero, and uh, it can take uh, um, signals uh, on some protocols, uh, SPI, I2C, uh, serial, which is the uh, you know very common old protocols. But what it won't do is measure voltages. The Arduino will measure voltages, right? So okay, so the, the Arduino's got a tiny head up on the Raspberry Pi because if you want to measure the voltage on something, if you want to put a dial on it and you turn the dial with a potentiometer, it's a very simple thing to wire up. There's other ways to do it with, with Raspberry Pis, with, with uh, sensors, but, or, eight, or with the Arduinos. So it's got a tiny head up there. But then I went, like, really, why would I do that? I hear people doing balloon projects, and they're sending uh, uh, Arduinos up in the sky. And I'm thinking, why would they do that with a Raspberry Pi? Because, you know, it's got that whole Debian back application. You can do anything. You can have web servers on it. You can have photo uh, processing, all sorts of stuff. And it kind of came to, to me as a brainstorm over my, my injuries when I realized that, um, you know, you have a very timing dependent thing sometimes and less so others. So if you're running a, a whole operating system, you'll have interrupts in that happening in the operating system. It'll, it'll break up the flow of the timing, the measuring or something like that, to a certain degree. Not terribly important. But if you're doing something like uh, a professional musician, your instruments have to be 100% reliable. I've been to maybe two gigs in my life where an instrument's failed. I can think of two. And that was devastating. It's like, what's wrong with you? You'll never work here again. It's got to be 100% right now. It goes. And I realized that the um, Arduino devices, if they were incorporated into something like a musical instrument, would be able to keep up the, the data flow and the rate that uh, you would need to make an instrument work properly. And you might be thinking, well, oh, hey, you got MIDI instruments, that's easy, anything can do that. But not if you're actually trying to make an instrument's keys move exactly up and down at the same time, right, in sync. Not just down or up, but quarter way down, one twenty-eighth of the way down. You want to get everything exactly so that when you're using a, a, a virtually controlled instrument, with a real acoustic system, it's able to handle the data rate of you know, uh, 12 to 16 inputs uh, at measuring to 120 position accuracy or something like that. Right? So the sudden brainstorm wasn't quite that detailed, but the sudden brainstorm was that, hey, I could make an instrument that would allow me to play music but not go through the same inflections that I'm going through that are causing all my repetitive strain injury. I could reduce the number of keys. You only need maybe five keys to get three octaves of music because you do it in binary. It's a lot simpler, right? Or I could change it to trumpet fingerings. There's only three keys and a little dial to turn, something like that. I mean, there's a lot of different ways you could uh, 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 control an instrument like that. Uh, the other thing being programmable, you could change that, right? So either something like a, a, a computer or a Raspberry Pi would be able to do that, but the Arduino devices would be able to uh, um, also be uh, 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 reprogrammable too. And a final thing, the, the Arduino devices actually draw very little power. Um, I mean, you think like a, a Raspberry Pi uh, uh, model A, B, B plus, zero, is drawing less than a watt even under a high load, right? But 
when you pull the instrument out of the box, you want it to work every time, and maybe you didn't get a chance to plug it in and give it enough battery power to get you know three hours of performance out of it, right? Three watts, three, three watt hours of power is a lot different than 0.6 watt hours of power or 0.2 watt hours of power. So there's, there's a, a, a different things that uh, made that kind of uh, um, a drive to try and uh, use these these devices. So I set myself a goal. I'm nowhere near it right now. I wanted to have a basic instrument produced within three years. And the first, the first uh, thing I decided to do was to relearn programming and to do it more properly than I did it in basic back in high school, right? So I started out with the, uh, um, the uh, uh, IDE for, um, for the Arduino. I don't think, yeah, I got a little picture of some stuff here. And you know, if you take a look, this is their, their beginner program for Arduino. And it doesn't actually look that much different from the old basic, right? When I look at that from what, I, what I've seen before, it's, it's telling you to do something here, it's got a loop. I mean, it's kind of like an old basic program. It isn't what I understand now as functional programming or objective programming, but uh, it's understandable for a complete noob musician like me. So it was a really, really good introductory point to come in and doing this stuff, right? <coughs> But over here you see what, what happens when you start getting a little more complicated. And this is, uh, how many people have actually looked at uh, Arduino, the Arduino IDE? Have you seen it? And the IDE is very simple, right? It's basically text editor, a little bit of highlighting, uh, a little bit of, uh, of uh, history, not much. And uh, um, you know, you've got to do a lot of hunting to find out how to make it. <coughs> so for really simple projects, they, they, it goes really well like that. It gets a little more complicated. You're probably going to want to start getting into a, a better IDEs. But I started getting up to writing stuff like this, and um, and I kind of started hitting wall. Right. So um, what happened was as as the uh, uh, progress of my idea, how am I going to get started building this really complicated instrument that'll help me keep my career going and probably make a really good product because. Flutes and saxophones sell for a lot of money, right? So handmade instruments are, are multiple thousands of dollars. They're, they're car value, right? So <laughs> it'd be nice to make a few of these things. So I decided that I, I'd start off with doing like the simple projects that everyone does, and that is getting onto uh, a few sites like uh, Adafruit.com. Anyone know about this? Yep. Adafruit, yeah, okay. I go, go on Adafruit.com, and I did a lot of tutorials did things with blinking lights and stuff like that. And uh, um, again, like that application that, you know, here, here's this device that'll allow me to create some kind of instrument, right? Um, uh, uh, the, the application started coming on a bit further. So about a year and a half ago, I, uh, I'm a member of the astronomy club, and uh, I, I went to a meeting, and there was a contest, and I won a prize, and I won this thing here which is called a Star Tracker, and I thought, oh, that's kind of a nice prize. It looks kind of swank. That must be worth a little bit of money or something. Turning this out, it's like a $500 Star Tracker, and I go, oh my goodness, I've got to do something about this. I don't even have a digital camera, right? It's for, for tracking the stars as the, the Earth turns, right? And I said, okay, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a digital camera. So I got on Kijiji, and I got a nice digital camera. And instead of a point and shoot, an actual you know, nice little digital camera. But it turns out this will only take up to a 30-second exposure and you want to have more exposure time on your camera, right? So what do you do? I think, well, what am I going to do? OK, I'll look up on the internet what people do. And they say, well, you can make a bulb uh, button. Now, on old cameras, there used to be really old cameras. There used to be a big bulb. And you squeezed it, and it pushed air down the tube, and that fired the shutter. And this is like back when they had the big flash pots like this, and you know, people walked like this in movies. Right? <laughs> So uh, they, they'd switch the bulb and the camera would go. And then more modern cameras like I had in the, in the 90s, you'd push a little cable, cable release, bulb, and uh, that'd make the shutter go on the camera. So apparently on this particular model of Canon, what you can do is connect a, a, essentially a headphone jack, and you short the headphone jack, you complete the circuit, and the, the shutter fires. I don't, well, hey, you know, an Arduino has like 16 pins that are just, you know, 
on-off pins that I can control this with. I can run like 16 of these cameras. I can do like the matrix circle thing with you. <laughs> right? Really, I mean, you literally can. It's not hard. If you get a whole bunch of friends with digital cameras and you put them in a circle and you go like this real slow, you can do the whole thing. They just did that with digital cameras, right? And they probably did it with something very similar to an Arduino or maybe even a guy you know, with a big rotary switch like this is going like that. Now they do it with Arduino. So um, the, uh, the, the, the plan started you know, building up and what I wanted to avoid doing was getting really complicated and having a lot of features and, and uh, uh, making things you know, unprogrammable for me or unusable when it came to it. And I know one thing, when you're out in the dark with a telescope, anything goes wrong, your night is over, right? Because as soon as you turn on a flashlight to find that screw, you, your night vision is gone. It's no fun, right? It's just like, where did the stars go? There were millions of moments ago, now there's like 17, right? So, so you, you want things to be really simple in the field, and you want things to work, and again, you know, these Arduino kind of devices kind of are good that way. They're fairly reliable. And uh, um, also, I wanted the program to be simple, so I started my, my and this is actually the presentation I did to the Astronomy Club, and uh, I'll just go back around a little bit here. You don't need all that stuff. I said I'd do it with the KISS principle, you know, keep it simple, stupid. And uh, I went on quite a long way like that. And what I found I was doing is I was writing code, and it was looking like this. You know, the, several times I have to write the same if statements to read a button and turn a light on. And then I said, well, okay, can we do more here? Do I have to li literally write spaghetti code like I did in basic? and uh, 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 do it this way, or is there a better way to do it? And it turns out that Arduino supports a full uh, C++. So you can actually write, if you know how to write C++ code, and I think you do, <laughs> C++ code, you can write it here, and you can apply their few functions that they have within the code. And I'll just say, right when I'm here, this very basic program here, um, they have two functions in the program. There's no main. What happens is this gets recompiled, and it's, the main is added to it. This is stripped into functions, and the, they're called, right? So they've tried to simplify it for us, right? So the, the two functions you need are set up. It's run once when the, uh, the program starts. And you think, void setup, that's a great thing when you're a noob and you don't understand functions. I'll put all my variable definitions in here, and then you go call your variables in here, and nothing happens. It's like you're getting all these, you know. Outside of this scope, the variable is not known outside. So it turns out void setup is just for setting up the Arduino, setting up a serial port, setting up things like that. So what I'm doing here is I'm telling it that the pin number 13 is an output pin. And that just says I can turn it on or off. I can have an input pin saying is it on or off. I can have an analog input pin saying what's the voltage. Or I can have an analog output pin saying make it high for the voltage, higher or lower. It isn't actually higher or lower, but it's very similar to that, right? And the program here, it says digital write to that pin high. It says wait a second, 1,000 one milliseconds. It says digital write that pin low. And what happens, pin 13 has always got a little LED on it, so it's just blinking an LED. And this is your hello world for Arduino, right? There's better ways of doing this, but this is your starter program. So, um, so I, I was you, writing like this, and things were getting big and ugly. And I, I read, I, I went, I got to learn something here. So I learned how to write an object in C++, and spent three days writing an object to, to uh, turn on my LEDs. And uh, it was like way beyond his principle for me because I hadn't even learned how to use functions yet. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, I guess I got to put functions. What are they? Right? Okay, so I, I kind of dived in the head at the top end. The great thing was, though, the first time it ran without a bug. So I'm really happy. So that was good, because I'm not going back there for this program. <clears throat> so um, the, uh, the device, for this particular purpose, th again, this is my uh, learning tool for me, right? Uh, you, have, you don't have to do a lot of electronics, but you can do a lot of and you know what this is, is it's, uh, uh, you can look at it this way. Here's a, a device that has a protocol, 
And I don't have an interface for that protocol. I can actually run this Arduino into another computer through, uh, through its USB connection or into a Raspberry Pi, <coughs> and script in the Pi, or I could do, just <coughs> import this program into the Pi and compile it there with a few uh, code changes to fit the pins on the Pi and get it to do the job, right? But w what I have is a, um, a protocol, which is just an on-off switch, and no way to access it, so I just made a protocol interface, right? Now, so there might be some applications you have, you've got some protocol on some device, and you can't do anything with it because it's old. Um, actually, a really good example uh, I heard from the Adafruit uh, uh, group there is someone rebuilding an old synthesizer and uh, one of the chips isn't available for the synthesizer. So he used the chip for one of these and programmed it to give the same digital uh, outputs as the original synth uh, would have done. So a, a software version of the old hardware chip from the 80s to rebuild a new version of the synth. So anyways, what I'm going to do, this isn't actually an Arduino chip, and that's something, or uh, Arduino in itself here. This is a, 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 an act-alike chip, right? And uh, they all, pretty much all use a chip uh, from the company called uh, Atmel. It's the 18 mega 328 is the chip that they use. There are some other devices in the uh, Arduino family that use uh, ARM chips, that's chip in, very equivalent to uh, old flip phone chips, about the same sort of power as, as something like that, right? This is gonna be more like a, a, a 90s pre-flip phone chip. It's not a very powerful, it's eight bits, right? It just does the job enough it, it, as well as I can. So I figured what I'd do is I'd just let you take a look, because it's, it's tough enough. It's been outside in the rain a few times, or not rain, but the mildew, the dew and that. Um, the interface on this guy is, oh, and the first of all is, the device is here. Again, it's not a standard Arduino. This clips into these breadboards a little bit nicer, and it's a lot smaller. Standard Arduino is about like that. It has almost all the same functions. You plug USB cable in it, you upload the program, right? Um, the way this thing works, you go outside, you plug it in, and it, I actually wrote an, uh, a user manual. Here we go. Here's the thing, you can see the blown up version, right? So there's my, inter my buttons. Uh, there's the device that's actually doing all the thinking for me. That's a very small, it's a, it's a mini, mini uh, audio cable. It's not an actual 3.5, I think there. 2.5? 2.5. 2.5, yeah. And a uh, 9 volt battery. A nice thing with these, these devices, a lot of them have a, a power converter on it, so you can plug anything from about 5 up to about 16 or 18 volts into it. So whatever battery you have, plug it in and it'll work, pretty much. Not all of them, but pretty much. And the other nice thing <coughs> too is that it'll output that power to the device you're building. Um, so the device, uh, you press this button here, it gives you a 30 second exposure, and it keeps doing it over and over, it repeats it. This one's a minute, minute and a half, two minutes, three and a half, and five minute exposures, because that's just basically around where I want to be taking exposures. I could have put a dial on it and said I, I can get anywhere from here to three hours, like a second to three hours, but then I would have to put a, like a, some sort of LCD or LED or something on it that had a, 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 an output that I could read. And again, I don't really want to re read it. I want it to be fire and forget, basically, right? So um, uh, the usage is I go out, I plug it in. Where's that user's plug-in camera? Turn on, there's a switch on the nine volt battery there. Uh, plug it into the camera and hit the button and it starts taking pictures. So I'm really happy, I mean, I've done some other things too, uh, like currently uh, I've been working uh, an exercise on functional programming, seeing so I need to know that, yeah, instead of doing objective first, right? So, so I've been working on my functions and I've been doing a, a temperature controller for lenses, because what happens in Manitoba is your lens gets really dewy right away. Um, you're out for half an hour and it's dewed over, you've got foggy pictures, or none, right? So a lot of folks have fairly expensive systems that uh, control the temperature of their lens, keep it just above dew point. So I've, I, uh, you can get a lot of devices online, eBay or one of these shops, Adafruit or some, uh, others, um, that are uh, sensors for a lot of different things. Light levels, heat levels, touch, uh, capacitive touch is a very cool thing, so you can put buttons on things and the buttons don't move. Um, 
and uh, in this case humidity and, and temperature. So uh, currently when I uh, get going in the morning, oops, hang on, I have my uh, weather coming in from my, that's my Raspberry Pi desktop, there we go. So up here, that's, a, uh, that's an Arduino reporting to the Raspberry Pi over serial, the temperature and humidity and the dew point and the heat index, kind of like your relative human temperature inside when you're in you know, different uh, humidities, right? And the application in that being as the program gets developed, it'll be used to control the heater on the camera. But at the moment, it's just the weather. So kind of handy. Um, the other thing too is that, you know, just showing off here, this is last night's project with my boy in the Raspberry Pi. We're working on uh, a jumping game. And uh, he's nine, and he understands how to use if statements. I'm really proud of him. <laughs> and the cool thing, this, this is Scratch programming. Do you know much about Scratch programming? Everyone knows? Yeah, you've done some Scratch programming? It's really cool because what I realized is that your programming is actually in little objects side by side. So when he's programming, he's starting off right away doing one, one object here for this, this guy here, another for the stage in the background, a separate object for little enemies or little bricks or whatever. So he's really used to the idea, oh, I've got to have a separate object here to program right from the, from the scratch. It's really cool, and it, it works really well. It's on a Pi 3, and this guy was bouncing all night. It was really funny. <laughs> he turned, uh, turned on the screen in the morning. So. And that's the uh, security camera system running there several Raspberry Pis, one with an IR camera and things like that going on. And uh, I also get the, uh, I, uh, I, on that Pi, it's got an Apache server uh, just installed and running. And uh, I pulled in some uh, 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 space weather, current well, uh, cloud cover. Space weather is basically, are there auroras tonight? So I can run straight out and find them. So that's, that stuff's there all the time on the Pi. And that Raspberry Pi is actually what I run the development uh, environment for the Arduino on. So all the programming for the Arduino is done on the Raspberry Pi. And that's my boy's next project. So, so um, that's kind of like, you know, that's what I uh, talk about applications, is that uh, if there are things that you want done that you'd like a computer or a robot or a thing to do, you can program it and have uh, inputs, outputs, whatever you want. If you, uh, there's a few examples where people have, you know, uh, uh, successful compiles, a green light comes on, unsuccessful compiles, the sirens go on, right? <laughs> Your network goes down, the same sort of thing, <laughs> alarms and lights, and that all basically done either with a uh, 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 Raspberry Pi or an Arduino. Um, and uh, yeah, it's kind of like you can have what you want, right? So, so I want to show off, you say, hey, this guy's talking a lot, why would he do this? This is why. That's the first photo taken with the Arduino camera controller. Now that's that camera with a slightly longer lens on it, but that's it, right? Nothing much more. Uh, the nice little tracker really helped to keep it lined up. That's five minutes of light falling on the camera, and that galaxy is somewhere between two and three million light years away. That's a long way away. Um, so where did you shoot it? Yeah. That was taken. Oh, that was taken at um, Peace Gardens Park. Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, it's a pretty good sky there. It yeah. was really good. It was actually taken right in the. Uh, I was teaching a band camp uh, last September, yeah. and I just did it right beside my dorm with the dorm lights and that going at the same time. So it's not perfect skies, but five minutes with a modern camera and almost any lens, you'll get that. How yeah. long was the lens that you used? Do you remember? 135 millimeters, oh. so not a lot. Yeah. Like a standard lens with a camera today is something like, you know, maybe 28 to 85 or 40 to 150. Yeah, I thought 210. 210? Yeah, 210. Well, that is the center of the chip. It is blown up. So the actual chip's about here. The photo's about here. But at the same time, you still have, you know, millions of pixels. It's a, it's a good photo for what it is, right? Um, the other application being, uh, I can, it, it's really cool, I set up with a friend, he's got his Nikon and a little button, and he presses the button for a little while and goes, I think I got about a minute, right? And I set up mine and I go, click, and then I sit back in my lawn chair and watch the meteor shower, played, or uh, Perseid meteor shower in August. I saw about 120 or odd meteors, it was awesome. Um, this photo was the fourth frame. And I got about 150 frames before my battery died and the card was full and it was done. But that's a Perseid meteor there. 
And I've never actually taken a photo of a meteor before. So I'm really happy with that one, right? Uh, there's also, you can see faintly, a satellite going by. I thought, I got two meters, but that's going the wrong direction, and it's a satellite. <laughs> you can tell because the frame before, it's right here messing up the photo. Right? Um, but that's not actually the coolest thing, because um, what I did, I'm taking frame after frame after frame after frame for, with this camera, so uh, I stitched them together. Come on, machine. And I get this. Uh-oh. This video is airplay on my Apple TV. Do we have an Apple TV in the room? <laughs> uh, it's working. It, oh, it is? Oh, I see. Oh, Sorry. Oh, it, it thinks it's on airplay. Okay, there we yeah. go. So here we go. I get it. There we are. So this is about an hour and a half of uh, sky going by. The Arduino taking a photo every 30 seconds because I want to catch as many meters as I can. I cranked up the uh, exposure on the camera there. And this little dot is the same galaxy as in the first photo. Oh. Hmm. Right, taken with that lens there. Right. So, and you know, the cool things, you see the motion of the sky. You see the meteor go streaming by right at the beginning. You see clouds going by, right? And uh, I, I'd like to get some more nice clear skies and evenings to go out and take some photos of, uh, of you know, stars rising over the horizon and reflecting in lakes and, and things like that as they go by. But that little device has made that, that there possible. So. And eventually something similar to that, I hope will make a multi-thousand dollar instrument I can sell to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's everything I have to say there. Uh, questions? Your motion software, is it running on the Pi itself as well? Each one or is it Each separately, yeah. Each separately, Each separately but there, uh, I, I aggregate it it's through just HTML. Oh, so it's just pull the release. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's basically, it's, I start to set it up so that, that each was um, uh, just its own little unit, and I kind of re realize there's a fail point there. You break in, you wreck the camera, or you take it, and you know, your, your, your video is gone. But it, at first, it was like, quick, let's get this up. So uh, when I got the Pi 3, it just had a lot more oomph. The motion is pretty intensive on the CPU as well. It's doing big areas, so. Well, you know, the, uh, all the remote cameras are um, uh, B pluses. And when there's nothing going on, they are pretty much constantly running about 35 to 40%. But if What's there's action, it's about 80. What's your image resolution on this camera? Uh, a couple of USB cameras are 720, I think, T, like actual high high definition, and the um, the uh, infrared camera is uh, one of the Raspberry Pi cameras. I can't remember, but it's a fairly large yeah. frame. So you're uh, actually, this, yeah, you're feeding this hydro too, I guess, right? This is those, you're it's that? This power, right? Yeah. yeah so it's a regular power line going through. I just a uh, little BC adapter plugged into the just standard Pi setup. It's not run off uh, 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 batteries or any backups at the moment. But I mean, you know, one of the things with the, 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 the Pi, it's, it's very adaptable. And what, I thought, hey, maybe people want information. So like Saturday, I thought, hmm, do I have time to make a, ser a file server and a, a web server? I could you know, uh, put an uh, access point on it and just you can log into that and grab information off. And I thought, well, it's great. So I have all the pieces at home and it's not built yet. <laughs> right, because I had other things to do this weekend. You know, two days I'm not really going to get that done. But then uh, today I was thinking, well, you know, I go out to gigs and uh, I don't take my music books with me anymore because we have files, right? I keep all my music in files. But I actually have some music books and there's, there's tens of gigs of music books. I, I, I've had them all on my, my uh, iPad. It's an awful lot of dead space when you actually only use one song from a book every two or three years, right? Mm -hmm. So if I've got like a Raspberry Pi with a flash drive in, and I, I love these little uh, SanDisk Fit drives, and I think Samsung's making them now. They're very short, stubby drives. So I got a 32 gigabyte drive in, and it barely covers the USB port. It, I mean, you, you, you can put it in the same tiny box, right? It'll always fit. So that and a battery, and I can flick the battery and let it boot headless and just start pulling my files off the Raspberry Pi on the iPad, right? Mm -hmm. So, and keep a lot of information in files like that. You can make an external hard drive for my iPad. Us musicians use a lot of iPad, or they're on the stage all the time now, because like all our charts are on there. And my tuner. <laughs> <laughs> and other things that help me sound not terrible, so. <laughs>
Uh, any other questions on these things? Okay, thanks a lot for letting me talk. I, uh, I think there's a lot of folks here who have way more understanding of some of the principles behind some of these things than I do, but it's uh, really nice to come out and give it a shot. And uh, Interesting group, thanks very much. <laughs> Oh, and I was going to say, if you are interested in seeing, I didn't mention one other thing. There's another brand. Uh, ARM uh, Microchips is making uh, ARM embed processors, and these are stinking hot little processors. They're many, many times faster, and they have a lot more input and output. So, and they actually tend to be a bit cheaper, too, because they're really trying to push these into other devices. Hmm. So uh, this company, SD Micro, uh, if you look at embed.org, uh, embed um, you'll see there's uh, them and others have a lot of different processors and Bluetooth built-in processors and all sorts of really awesome hardware. But there's a bit of hardware up here, including a homemade uh, Arduino copy right there. Mm -hmm.